I gather we have uh, a number of roaming mics. Hands up. Yes, yes. And so, um, get the attention of the mic holder um, if you want to uh, raise a question. So, um, I'll start now by inviting questions from the floor. Y yes. Uh, thank you, Judge. Uh, our table here uh, just would like to uh, raise the issue in regard to fetal abnormalities and uh, say that the legislation doesn't take this into account in any way at this moment in time in regard to what it says. Um, and also um, that possibly the situation is not in the mother's control. We feel that the, or the table here feels that the mother doesn't have um, adequate control over the situation. It's, it's really in the medical uh, in legal hands at the moment. I just know how you feel about that. I don't know whether I classify either of those as a legal question or a question on the law at the moment. Um, of course, the issue of uh, um, fatal, fetal abnormalities is a, a big issue in this context. Um, and um, I think um, it, Owen said in his uh, written paper that it's something we'd be considering we will probably be considering down the road. And um, that's about all he has said in his paper about it, and that was with our approval. Um, so uh, basically, I, I, th I think that that is a question for another day. Uh, in, in other words, for a, another of our sessions, it, it's one of the things you will be, might consider tomorrow morning, uh, whether I think it has to be a matter we will discuss. Um, it, in, in the remaining weekends, um, but I, I, I think for now, uh, I think I, 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 I think we should leave it aside for the moment, um, and that's not trying to avoid the question. I want to make that absolutely clear. It's just that I don't think it's suitable for today. It, would that be your position, Owen? I, I think in terms of the, the current law, as far as I understand it, there really is no clarity on what the current legal position is, and therefore. It, for the purposes of, of, of today in terms yeah. of informing you as to what we can say the law is. Yeah. Um, that's an issue we just don't know. Yeah, so that they, Owen has, is, is telling us about the current law. Um, th there may be other matters to consider in relation to fatal fetal abnormalities. The second question, situation not in the mother's control. Uh, Owen, is there a legal issue there that you can discuss or clarify in this particular context, the context of the current law? I, th I think, I mean, I think ad adequate control is probably a, a judgment about the policy and I don't, I don't want to, um, and it's not my role today to express a view about um, the merits or demerits of, of any particular approach. Um, I think you'll be hearing this afternoon from uh, medical people who are involved in the actual process of what happens if someone, um, if this issue arises in practice. Um, and, and they may be better able to give you a sense of um, how a mother is dealt with um, from that point of view. I mean, from the legal point of view, particularly with the 2013 Act, um, lawyers don't have much involvement in how it operates so far in practice. So the, the, the doctors are probably better placed, I think, to answer or to give you a sense of, of, of how that, that procedure works. Um, do you feel that is a sufficient answer pro tem? And I say only pro tem. Sorry. Uh, the, the table here were just interested in other aspects of this, and uh, as you say, um, it may well be an issue for tomorrow. Uh, yes. But I think it's just uh, probably an opening uh, aspect in regard to uh, people's views yeah. here yeah. Uh, at this moment. C could I just ask you to clarify when you say uh, the situation not in the mother's control? What have you in mind? I, I think you're not thinking of somebody of unsound sound mind or anything like that. No, or no, no. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. No, that. Judge, no, not in regard to that. I think the the general feeling here at this table was that the the mother didn't have as much input in regard to making the decision oh, um, yes. as she maybe could yeah. or should have. Well, it may be something that could be addressed. Um, after, after this in the, absolutely. Question, absolutely. In the afternoon, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh. Um, I'm just the facilitator. Yes. Uh, we have two concerns, or uh, two 
issues we'd like to uh, seek more information on. The first is the, the issue of how the procedures actually work, and I know there will be medical, uh, Owen has said there will be medical um, with um, speakers, but just in regard to, I suppose, just the general, how the, how the, the legal procedures are at the moment. You mean under the 2013 Act? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. and also in particular with uh, some emphasis on the time frame as in how long does that process actually take to start off and to complete? And then there was a question at the table about the threat to life, uh, the threat to life, whether that included, and again, it's the current um, situation where the fetus themselves have some threat to their health or life. And again, it is the fatal fetal abnormalities. If that could be clarified insofar as possible. Yeah. Is that the... I mean, I, th I think... I'm reluctant to give you too much guidance in terms of how the procedure works because, to be honest, um, yeah. the law only sets down the framework. It only gives the kind of outer procedures and the outer limits. What actually happens in practice really is yeah. something the lawyers don't deal with. It's something the doctors deal with. Yeah. Um, and I'd be misleading you if I offered you an informed view because I, I simply don't. I've never had an involvement in that in, in that process. Um, so, and I think I think. You, you would be better to get that view after the lunch from the people who actually you know, are involved in these processes. They'll be able to answer those questions about what actually happens. Because the law simply, let's say, it gives guidelines. Um, but there are areas of discretion within those guidelines in terms of you know, how quickly or how slowly. Or, you know, it's up to the individual situation, the individual doctors. Um, they may go faster than the lower courts, for example. So I, I think that's something that um, I, th I think we're probably better dealt with. And as I said, in relation to the fatal fetal abnormalities, in terms of my remit, which is simply telling you what the law is currently is, we just don't know what the law is there. And again, it would be misleading for me to give you a statement saying, we know this is what the law is, we don't. Um, it's an issue that there are arguments about, there are disagreements about. Um, people have different interpretations of the article. They have different interpretations of, for example, the Roche decision and whether that may have implications for um, that situation. But we don't have a definitive Supreme Court decision. We don't have a definitive view on it and we don't have definitive rules on it. Um, and therefore, anything I would say would just be my own judgment, which carries no weight. Um, so in terms of understanding the current law, um, all I can say in terms of what's accurate is we just don't know. Well, again, I, it seems to me that the first question may arise again in the afternoon. Um, that's in relation to the procedure and the time frame under the Act of 2013. And um, as I say, uh, the second question, Hopefully, we'll, we'll, we'll get to dealing with it at another session. Yeah. 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 How are you doing? Uh, a question for Owen. Um, the recommendations that we'll be given at the end, are, that should be presented at the end, will that be with a view to actual the wording of the article and cha the changing of the wording of the article, or just the fact that the article itself can be changed constitutionally? I think, well, I, th I think that's probably a judgment for, for you all to make. Um, no, I know, but what I mean is, 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 is that, that are, are we looking specifically for text for an article or a change to an article or just literally just that the article is such, like you said yourself, that it's, it's fairly general, it's not that specific, but that it can be moved about, messed about or changed, do you know what I mean, rather than actual come up, coming up with offers of words, the actual text that will be in the, a changed article. Well, I, I suppose I should really answer that question. Um, that, if I may use the expression, in the heel of the reel will be a matter for um, the citizens. We're not anywhere near determining um, how we're going to make recommendations. We're just getting an overview of the current situation today, and um, th that is something uh, that, that we will hopefully um, form a view on um, in the not too distant future. Maybe a th third meeting, maybe. Um, but it, it's, it's really a matter for us. There are a whole lot of options, as you know. Um, but we will have to decide uh, what way we are going to make recommendations to the Oireachtas. It's for us. Uh, hello. Um, we would like to um, 
ask a few questions uh, in the context of um, the three medical practitioners, uh, two of whom must be psychiatrists to cert certify that it is necessary to avert a real and substantial risk. Um, is there statistics available uh, on, given someone has declared that there is a problem due to depression or mental health issues in general, is there a difference between the suicide rates of those that have been admitted into the public mental health system uh, and those that have been admitted into the private health, uh, private mental health system? Um, and also, there's a, a, another question. Um, uh, how many expected mothers have committed suicide or attempted suicide in recent years? Um, that's the second question. Now, the other, I've, we have one more question. Can I just say, in relation to that, in fairness, that yeah. is not a, a question. Yeah, I, I understand that. And, but and it can be repeated in the afternoon when we have people who may be able okay. to answer it. Okay. Uh, um, and just with, with, with uh, a comment on the uh, standing orders and the sequencing of the topics uh, that are to be discussed, uh, we are very concerned about uh, Ireland's environmental responsibilities being placed last in this list uh, and we are wondering if this can be moved up um, uh, to maybe become the second or third all issue right, being discussed. Right. That's the climate change um, topic. Yes, the climate change topic. Now, the, the, right. the, the, there, there may be another question or two the facilitator has. We have uh, one or two questions in relation to um, has anybody been prosecuted in this jurisdiction uh, either for having an abortion or for uh, aiding or helping in one being carried out? Well, you should qualify that uh, by saying since um, 1983, I think. Mm. There would have been. Sir, I mean, from the 2013 Act. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, since, since 2013. Um, oh, not, since 2013. Not that I'm aware of. Um, I'm not aware of any prosecution since, since 2013. Um, th there is a report issued, I think it's referenced in the paper, um, every year um, which the Minister lays before the Iraq this indicating how many times the Act was used. Um, and on average so far it's been sort of 20 to 30 times um, per year. Um, okay. But in terms of, I'm not aware of any prosecutions. Um, okay, very well. Um, one other question was we had, um, at what stage or what point does a test tube embryo become described as unborn? Well, as I say, the, that's, we, have, we have a partial answer to that question from the Roach case. Um, what the Roach case decided um, yeah. was that the embryo um, pre-implantation, so an embryo that had been obtained during IVF, um, was not an unborn um, until such time as it was implanted. Um, and that was largely, I mean, there was various reasons given, but I mean, just probably to give you a sense of, of, of the reasoning. Mm -hmm. Um, you'll recall Article 43.3 you know, makes reference to the rights of life of the unborn and the equal rights of life of the mother. And the views expressed by at least some of the Supreme Court that you know, that article is about that relationship, that the situation where those two rights are intertwined and engaged, um, and that only happens after implantation. Um, and therefore, the view is taken that there had to be implantation um, before the unborn would, before, the, before that definition of unborn was met. Oh, and it might be helpful if, if, if you just told of the, 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 the factual background to that case. Yeah, sorry, I think it, 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 it's useful to know what was at issue there. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's, imp it's important to bear in mind, I think with any of the decisions um, that you're re referred to, whether in my paper or other papers, I mean, the courts can only decide the cases that are before them and only decide based on those facts. Yeah. And therefore, there's always an issue where situations are factually different, you know, where different facts come before the courts. They may give different different results because the facts change. Um, so whenever we say a, a case decides something, it really only decides for that, those parties or what the, what the law is for, for that particular factual situation. And if you change the facts, the outcome may be different. In terms of the Roach case, the, the Roach case referred to a, a couple who um, had undergone IVF, uh, I think successfully in relation to the first round and had a child yes. and subsequently split up. Um, and the question that arose was the, the mother wished to, to use the embryos um, and have further, have further rounds of IVF treatment um, and the father refused consent. Um, and there was an initial question about what they'd agreed to in terms of as a matter of legal contract and the forms they'd signed at the clinic and um, what they had agreed to. But the second question then was 
Um, what about the embryo? Um, did the embryo have rights under the Constitution? Did Article 40.33 apply to that embryo? Um, and the court concluded um, that it didn't, for the, for the reasons I've just said in relation to the implantation. Yes. <clears throat> the facilitator for Table 2. Uh, we had two questions for Dr. Carolyn um, on the current legal position. Um, first, if I can ask it, is uh, can EU law impact on Irish law in this area? And some reference was made to the ABC case. And I know you didn't discuss it, but I think it was in some of the papers. Yeah. Um, but yes. it, it would be much appreciated if you could uh, clarify what impact that could have. Yeah, and, and that was uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, as distinct from what we would call, what lawyers would call EU law, uh, which would be... I, I think it would also be helpful if that, that, was, that, yeah. that was clarified as well. Yeah. That, that's a, I mean, that, that's a, it's a complicated question, and um, but, it, but it is, I think, it's a good question. It's one that's worth um, bearing in mind. I mean, the first thing is that point: the the European Union law and the European Convention on Human Rights are different, and they're separate, and their status within Irish law um, is different as well. Um, European Union law um, automatically applies in Irish courts, um, and where there's a conflict between Irish law and European Union law, European Union law will take precedence. Um, the European Convention of Human Rights is a little bit different. Um, the European Convention on Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights is a different court. It sits in Strasbourg. The European Union Court sits in Luxembourg. So they're, they're, it's important to bear that in mind. Yes, that they are completely different courts with different judges in different places. Um, and, and the European Court of Human Rights, as the name suggests, deals mainly with human rights issues. Um, and it applies what's called the European Convention um, on Human Rights. And the relationship between that convention and Irish law, there may be some academic disagreement about this, but um, because as a matter of international law, its decisions are binding on Ireland. But as a matter of Irish law, the Constitution takes precedence. And the European Convention has been incorporated into Irish law. So the Oireachtas passed an act saying, this is part of Irish law. But they did so at what's called a sub-constitutional level. So as a matter of Irish law, if there's a conflict between what the Constitution says and what the Convention says, um, the courts should try as far as possible to reconcile that conflict. Um, but ultimately, if there is a conflict, the Constitution would prevail. Now, A, B, and C, as I've indicated, were three women who made com various complaints in relation to Irish abortion laws um, to the court in Strasbourg um, and claimed that it breached various, various different, different rights under the convention. The court found in favour of one of the women and found in favour on that specific issue that I mentioned, the lack of clarity. Um, the court, for example, and this was one of the arguments in the case, the court didn't find... Um, that having Article 40.33 was a breach of the European Convention on Human Rights. So one of the arguments made on behalf of the other two women was that simply having Article 40.33 was a breach of their rights. Um, the European Court rejected that on the basis they said, while there was, while other countries in Europe had other, had other, other rules in this and, there, and the majority of countries may have other rules on it, um, they felt the Irish constitutional position, having been endorsed by referendum, reflected particular judgments in Ireland and that didn't breach um, the convention. Where there was a breach was because the X case said abortion was lawful in certain situations, but there was a lack of clarity and detail and guidance about how that operated. So as I indicated, there was no clear rules about who would you ask, who would make a decision, who made that decision about when X applied, when those criteria were satisfied. The court felt that contravened the person's um, access to the law. And, and the European Court takes the view that law should be accessible it should be foreseeable. People should be able to understand their legal, their legal position and take advice on that. And they felt that was where um, Irish law failed to comply um, with the requirements of the Convention. And that was followed by the 2013 Act, which um, seems to do at least some of those things. Thank you. And the second question is that during your presentation, you posed the question, is Article 40.3.3 only about abortion? So the question arose at this table, what else could it be about and what other knock-on effects of altering or discussing this uh, could be impacted other than the issue of abortion? Well, I don't want to speculate, because again, yeah. the, the, my role is largely about telling you what the law is, um, but you know, the fatal fetal, fatal fetal abnormality issue has been raised um, and you know, that may have implications, um, potentially, but it's an area where we just don't know. Yeah. Um, so. Good afternoon. 
there's, as facilitator of this group, the three questions have arisen. Uh, number one, uh, under the current law, why did the uh, right relating to risk to the mother not apply in the case of Savina Halapanava? Uh, two, uh, if a, pre a, a woman was pregnant and had cancer, would she have the right to receive treatment if that treatment uh, caused a risk to the life of the child under the current law? And thirdly, conscious of the fact that I may be treading over ground already arisen, what what is the unborn, um, if there's any clarity on that, and when does the unborn precisely become the unborn in, in a situation not limited to IVF treatment? Yeah. Well, I think the first question, we, 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 the first question relates to a specific um, unfortunate event, and I, I don't think it would be appropriate f for anyone to express a view on it here. Um, but do you feel you can sort of give some general observations that... Yeah, I mean, I, I think in relation to the first and second question, particularly the second question, um, and I think it, it's very difficult, I think, to express concrete views about specific situations without having full knowledge of those situations. And the second, I mean, the second question you raise about a, a person who has cancer, um, and where that may be a risk, um, I can't say exactly what would happen because it would depend on the individual person, the cancer, the stage of the pregnancy. You know, there's various things that would be taken into account with that. Um, and that's what the 2013 Act is partly about. I mean, all I can say is it would be dealt with under the 2013 Act. Um, and therefore, again, I'm not wanting to put everything into the afternoon and, and where someone else has to answer the questions. And, but, and again, it's something the mm, medics may answer in the afternoon. You know, the, the, yeah, the, you, yeah. the, you may be able to give you a more concrete view about what would happen in practice when that comes in. Yeah. Um, all I can say is it would be dealt with under the 2013 Act, and, and it would be dealt with in accordance with the Criterion Act. So the, you know, the assessment would be, is there a real and substantial risk, um, and whether the criteria are satisfied. And then, as I say, in relation to the third question, we don't know any more than what w the clarification given by the Supreme Court in Roach. Roach and Roach, I'm the moderator of Table 9. Um, when we discussed the text of the Eighth Amendment, we discussed specifically one of the features which I think you had identified as possibly ambiguous, which was the, uh, the concept of the equal right to life of the mother and the unborn. And the view is expressed at this table that that's an impossible con uh, concept because where two absolutely equal rights are in conflict, how do you decide which prevails? Uh, can you possibly comment on how the courts, and I know you can't comment on medical practice, that was one of the things that was uh, discussed at this table arising from that, but in terms of the courts, how does the law deal with that difficult problem? I, I, it's a very perceptive question because I, I think yeah. that, that is the issue that arose in X, um, is precisely the question you just, you've just framed. Um, when you have two rights expressed to be equal and there's tension between them, what do you do? Um, and I mean, the answer is what the Supreme Court decided next. next yeah. um, the, the, that's, that's how that is dealt with under Irish law, yeah. um, by reference to those criteria. Hi, it's a question from Table 11. Um, in cases of uh, fatal fetal abnormality, where there is no possibility of life outside of the womb, is termination currently permissible under the Act? I mean, as you get the, the fatal... The law, we don't, we don't have a clear statement of the law on that. The, under the Act, um, it's only permissible if it satisfies the criterion X. So there would have to be a real substantial risk to the life of the mother. Okay, and maybe leading on from that is, uh, under the current Act, has a termination in the case of fatal fetal abnormality taken place in the state? Um, and if that is the case, was the decision made by the medical staff or by the courts? I'm not aware. I mean, the, the, because the Act um, and because the reports on the Act only deal with the grounds in X, um, Section 7, Section 8, Section 9, that set out the, the, the circumstances in which a termination or an abortion is available and is lawful under Irish law, they make no reference to fatal fetal abnormalities. And therefore, the reports that indicate how many abortions were carried out under those sections also don't refer um, to, now, it's possible there may be an overlap, but certainly there's been no reported um, case on that specific ground where the reason given was um, fatally loaded. In relation to people traveling abroad, yeah. I have no specific information about that. Yeah. Um, 
so the law, the law doesn't the law simply just doesn't really have any clear guidelines on that at present. Hi, I'm the facilitator for Table 7. We have two questions. Uh, the first is in relation to the pan panel of medical practitioners appointed by the HSE um, to decide reviews on whether or not an abortion um, can be uh, performed in any given case. Do, does the 2013 Act uh, specify any criteria for the election of those panel members or do they have a limited term? Is there any guidance on, on who and for how long those people can serve? And the second question is in relation to the relationship between contraception and abortion, um, particularly stemming from Roach and Roach. It's Roach and Roach suggests that once an embryo is implanted, it becomes life. And so where would the morning after pill, for instance, um, come into play? Or are there any, is there any guidance on that? The, well, Roach certainly, Roach certainly doesn't specifically address that, that question. No. Um, and therefore, again, you know, people can speculate about what the implications of Roach might be. Um, for that, but, but, but as a matter of, of, of law, the Supreme Court didn't address that question, yeah. um, and it wasn't specifically raised in the case. So um, again, it's, it's another it's another area where I think I said at the start of my paper, you know, it's an area where there's a lot of uncertainties in the law here, um, and Roach doesn't clearly address that. Um, again, in relation to the 2013 Act, I think it's helpful to have the, the medical people give advice on that. that it, it does lay down criteria in relation to eligibility, both in relation to people who serve on those panels, and also in relation to who counts the medical practitioner. And what qualifications need to have, you know, whether they need to register the medical council, they are laid down um, in the legislation. But how they work in practice is something that, you know, I, th I think the doctors are best placed to speak to because they, they have experience of that system operating that I just don't have. Hi, sorry, I just wanted to clarify something. Um, in terms of the constitution versus the legislation that's in place, is it the case that? The reason why there is a lack of clarity or, and in ambiguity in the law, is it because of the wording of the Eighth Amendment or is it because of the existence of it in its entirety, just if you could clarify? I think it's a good question. I mean, I think as I mentioned, Article 40.3.3 is broadly expressed, but that's not unusual in constitutional terms. Constitutions generally, and I mean, you can point to specific examples in other constitutions or our constitutions that are different, but as a general, as a general rule, constitutions express themselves quite broadly. They're about stating values and stating principles. And what that means in practice, not only in this area, but in other areas, are that the Constitution, it really sets the boundaries. You know, it gives guidance to the courts, it gives guidance to the Iraqis as the kind of things that are important and the kind of things they have to respect and comply with. But there's always a lot of room left for the details to be fleshed out. Um, and I say that's typically done through a combination of legislation um, or decisions of the courts. So legislation will provide, will provide details. Courts may be asked then to consider that legislation. On occasions, courts may be asked to assess whether the legislation is unconstitutional, or whether it complies with the Constitution. And that's true of other areas, not, not simply this one. Um, so in saying there are ambiguities and uncertainties, that, that's always the case with constitutional law. Um, so it's not, you know, but certainly Article 40.3.3, as I've indicated, there are certain aspects of it that are uncertain, that are ambiguous, but that's typical of other areas of the Constitution as well. Um, and legislation in the courts are typically how that's dealt with. And the 2013 Act is, you know, together with X, together with Roach, gives us some further guidelines as to what it means, but doesn't address all the issues um, necessarily. And, and, you know, they would be dealt with, you know, people have raised ones here. Legislation cases are ways they could be clarified. Yeah. Yeah. And a provision of the Constitution can't anticipate the large uh, variety of circumstances that may come to pass. We see it as lawyers, we see it all the time. Um, so uh, it, one has to go a different route probably, like in the X case, it was the Supreme Court or legislation to clarify the situation. But of course, one cannot interfere with the basic principle in the, in the Constitution. Neither, neither the courts nor the Oireachtas can, can do that. The duty is to apply the provisions of the Constitution. We're getting a little bit tight for time. Are there many more questions? Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the mic has gone behind you. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that as my cue, so George, All thank right. you. Uh, I'm a facilitator for table number 10. Yeah. Uh, 
it's, this is a question about context and climate. And the, the discussion at this table was, what's different now, today, from 1982 and 1983? And what are the drivers for change? What are also the legal drivers, the prevailing climate, context, and indeed uh, church influence? I mean, that's, that's partly a question of um, social history that I'm not qualified to answer. I mean, I was two in 1983, so I don't remember. Um, the, what I will say is, though, the, supreme, you know, the, 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 the factors I mentioned are the ones the Supreme Court have identified as being relevant. So in the Roach case, the Supreme Court considered and made reference to um, the climate in 1983. And certainly, the Supreme Court expressed the view that those decisions in England and in America had an impact um, because they, as, as I indicated, they were decisions that were based on somewhat similar legal, legal documents or legal principles. Um, and yeah, as I said, there was a disagreement about whether an Irish court would or even could have um, followed those decisions or taken a similar approach under the then constitution. But the belief that a court might um, did inform the public debate um, about, um, you know, and, and also is it just the general uncertainty about whether the 1937 constitution had any implications um, for this issue. Some of you just felt it did, but we didn't, we didn't know for sure. And therefore, there was, a, you know, there was a belief or a view that there was an uncertainty that could be addressed by an amendment. And obviously, different views were expressed as to whether that should be done or the merits. But certainly, the Supreme Court's view seems to have been um, that it was influenced by developments in other jurisdictions and by the, the uncertainty of the law at the time. That, this would be the last one, I think, yeah. 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 The question of children's rights. The question of children's rights. When they're talking about the Constitution, when the arguments are put, they use the whole Constitution. And they make a case that children have rights. Yeah. Surely the argument point that children have rights, it's no longer unborn. Are you talking about the situation in relation to a minor? Is that yeah. what a person under no, 18? I mean, there's, there's, the Constitution covers children's rights. It does, and yeah. People, and people are making the cases, making the case, that the child has rights. In, and equal, 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 isn't that with the unborn rights? I mean, I think... I think oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're into IRM, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there, there, are, there, are, there have been different views expressed on that, yeah. I think, by the High Court. Um, at present, and therefore, it's again an area where there's some uncertainty about the law. And yeah, yeah. And it's, it, 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 an issue has arisen in the very recent past in relation to that, um, and it looks as if it may go to one of the superior courts to be resolved in the not too distant future. That's, that's my reading of it uh, from reading the and newspaper. I mean, as, yeah, as, 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 as a general matter of interpretation, I mean, leaving aside. Article 42A, or, or you know, yeah, you're, you're entirely correct. When you, when you look at the Constitution, um, what the courts have said is you look at it as a, as a whole document. Um, and therefore, you don't necessarily just, I mean, obviously, if one article deals specifically with an issue, it's the most relevant. But there may be other parts of the Constitution relevant as well. Very good. Uh, you obviously had a, a, a very good discussion at each table. Um, I'm very impressed. The, the, the questions are very impressive. Um, some of them we haven't answered, but they can be raised again. And um, we'll sit again at two o'clock and uh, um, do some more work. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you all.